you guys for coming today. I'm Amy Hudson. I'm a dietitian at St. Francis Medical Center. I've worked there for 30 plus years and so I just thought I might introduce to you what a registered dietitian called a clinical dietitian at a hospital does and then answer any questions you guys have. So what is a registered dietitian? Basically, oh here, can you go back? Oh sorry. That's all right. Um, so a registered dietitian called an RD or an RDN is a food and nutrition expert who has met the big thing is the Commission on Dietetic Registration's criteria to earn the RDN credential. So we are a credentialed um, uh, profession, so um, there's a certain amount of schooling we have to have, uh, tests we have to take, and specifics that we have to do to become a registered dietitian. Can you tell us about your journey there? Like, yeah. Or is that, that's part of your thing? Yeah, yes. All right. So, just some of the things that are quali we are qualified to do is an RD, a registered dietitian, is qualified to provide medical nutrition therapy, MNT, and other evidence-based nutrition services to individuals, groups, and communities. So we work in a variety of settings. We work in hospitals, businesses, industries, wellness, uh, the public health system, education, research, government agencies, and some uh, dietitians that work in private practice. Um, some examples of these might be like community hospitals, like that's where I work, um, women, infant, and children, which is WIC, um, public health department. So dietitians that work in the public health department might actually have to do with doing like um, evaluations of kitchens and things like that. Um, food services, like your cafeteria program, is probably oversaw by a registered dietitian. Um, uh, programs for schools and universities. Uh, quality control and food production. So a lot of times, if you have industries like um, like Gilster Mary Lee, which is in Perryville or Chester, they have dietitians there that review quality and make sure everything is clean and meets certain specifics. Um, research at companies like Hershey's and Tyson Foods. So you see dietitians working there too. Uh, on that bottom right, well, it's not super convenient. I'll just get it. Is it right here? There's, there's a like, the ones. So Tap on it and again, and it should show on the other yeah, side. Yeah. So like this right here is not related to it, but tap one more time, and it shows up like here, and that's not a super oh. convenient place okay. for it, but it, in either way, if you okay, want me to click it, I will. Okay. So to become a registered dietitian, there are certain things you have to do. You have to earn an accredited bachelor's or master's degree in nutrition from an accredited council for education and nutrition dietetics accredited program. So basically that what that means, it's a four-year, at least a four-year degree, a bachelor's of science degree, at an institution that is accredited by the Commission on Dietetic Re Registration to, to have that program. So SEMO has that, Mizzou has that, a lot of colleges have that. But they will, if they have a degree in dietetics, then they should be accredited to do that. You have to get your bachelor's of science in dietetics. Then you have to complete a dietetic internship. So that is that involves applying to different internships all over the country, getting accepted, and usually doing like a year of internship with that with that program. Um, then you have to after you do that, then you're can take the CDR exam and you have to pass that. And then you obtain a state license, which is basically you, you tell them you're a registered dietitian, you show them your certification, and you pay an extra money to be licensed. So you have a licensure and then you're a certified dietitian. And then every five years you have to maintain 75 hours of your continuing education. So that's how you become a dietitian. So is that 75 per year? 75 for five years. For five years. Yeah, yeah. And so one of the things I do is um, there is a test I take to be a certified nutrition support dietitian, and I do that, um, well, it lasts for five years, so I have to take it every five years, and that actually gives me 75 hours of CEUs right there. So the studying for that, the taking of the test, the cost of all that actually gives me all my CEUs. But you can get cert um, CEUs through other things, like going to different classes, taking tests. There's all kinds of ways to get them. But it is a pain. Okay. Um, so, sometimes you might hear dietitian or nutritionist. So, in the United States, a dietitian is a board-certified food and nutrition expert who has completed extensive training in the field of nutrition and dietetics. So, a dietitian is qualified to provide evidence-based medical nutrition therapy and nutrition counseling. Um, 
So they are qualified to practice across a span of settings, including hospitals, outpatients, clinics, research institutions, and local communities. So the difference is, um, so the term dietitian is regulated in every state, but the term nutritionist is not regulated in every state. So almost anyone can call themselves a nutritionist. Um, so regardless of their education, you can say you're a nutritionist. Um, but a nutritionist cannot call themselves a dietitian. A dietitian call, can call themselves a nutritionist, and sometimes they do that because that's something that people are sort of familiar with, like a nutritionist, that's, they're familiar with that term. But if you're a nutritionist, you cannot call yourself a dietitian. That is illegal. But a dietitian can say, I'm a dietitian and a nutritionist. Um, so some people who call themselves nutritionists, though, may have completed some sort of degree in nutrition, like from a university that isn't accredited. But they really cannot. But they cannot legally call themselves a dietitian because they don't the really have any. Unless the university they went to has a program that's that is accredited, right? Accredited, yeah. accredited by the CDR, the Certified Dietetic right. Registration. Okay. Yeah. So the the we'll term are the term dietitian and nutritionist. They're often interchanged. But there are differences in qualifications. So a dietitian can call themselves a nutritionist, but a nutritionist who is not a, a registered dietitian cannot call themselves a dietitian. So legally, they can't do that. Okay. Um, so a registered dietitian as an occupation is expected to actually see a growth of 7% in the next years. And I have a feeling that's because we're having a big age group getting a lot older. So as that gets older, more of those people need health care. So nursing homes, hospitals are going to get busier. Um, there's an average of 5,600 new jobs in our country per year for being a dietitian, and the annual wage is $66,000. Mm. It's okay. That's not bad, though. It's all right. I mean, it's coming from a teacher. Like, <laughs> it's all right. That's not a bad wage, no, kids. No. It's really it's, not. Yeah. Do you usually earn that much? Is that your average wage? Um, I've been doing it for 30 years, so that's what I... I, that's about what I'm doing, but starting out, no. Starting out is probably 40. I would say 45-ish. And it really depends on where you work. Some places, like, <coughs> if you were to go into um, food service, in a food service like Morris, uh, Morrison, Cisco, um, I don't know if you're very familiar with those sort of things, but a lot of times they'll do cafeterias, They'll do cafeterias for like universities, for school services, for things like that. If you are into food service versus clinical nutrition, which is what I do, food service is a whole different ball game as a dietitian, and you can work make six figures doing that. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's if you can stand it. That is what that is what to go into is is, is food service. When you said if you can stand it, tell tell so, me what, what the difference was between their job and what you. So has anybody ever worked in any sort of food service like fast food? Oh, okay. So then you know. <laughs> so working in any sort of food service industry, whether it's a restaurant, a fast food industry, a cafeteria, that is sort of the same everywhere. And some people love it, and it's great. Um, but it is a lot of hours. It's um, difficult to get people to, to consistently work. So a lot of times you're having to do a lot of the kitchen work. Um, but if you move up, then that's really not on your shoulders. You're more of a management person. And there's plenty of things to do <coughs> sorry, as a dietitian because you are qualified then to do a lot of the menu planning, to do all, a lot of the research on the ingredients and um, labels and things like that. You can do evaluations and assessments on kitchen cleanliness and things like that. So there's, there's many opportunities in food service if you want to go that route. And that, where is, that is where a lot of the money is. You may have to move around a lot, but those it's more of a corporate job. So if you get in with the corporate, you could actually, if you love to move around or live around the world or live in different parts of the country, that's really a great job to get into. And to, it's like a hospitality as a dietitian. That's, that's a, a great opportunity for people. Um, so I work in the hospital. So what I do is I see patients who are <coughs> generally pretty sick. So I do more clinical health things with people. So what I do is I evaluate and assess nutritional status of patients <coughs> who are admitted at nutrition risk, including a nutrition-focused physical exam, 
Um, I evaluate and assess patients who are critically ill for nutritional needs and then make recommendations and initiate nutrition support <coughs> to meet their needs. Do you have any water? I'm so sorry. Yeah, All of a sudden, I've gotten super. Here, I got some coffee drops too. Oh, well, that, that's extra perfect. Let me get some water. No, this is perfect. This is good. Um, so I evaluate and assist patients who are critically ill for nutritional needs, and I make recommendations and initiate nutrition support for them. Um, I monitor those patients that are on nutrition support, and sometimes I provide nutrition counseling to patients who need education for healthier lifestyle, including diabetes, heart disease, stroke, weight loss, weight gain, and wound healing. So those are some of the things that I do at the hospital. So what, one of the things I do is called a nutrition focus, thank you, a nutrition focus exam. So what I'm doing is I'm evaluating nutrition status to evaluate for malnutrition. So that's one of the things I'm doing in the hospital is I evaluate patients for malnutrition. So what that does is it uses a physical exam and your observation to determine shape, color, texture, and size of the skin and just how their body looks. It enjoy, it, we use palpitation, which basically we're just sort of like measuring their skin. Um, we require a lot of touch with the tips and the pads of your fingers, so we're doing an evaluation a little like that. So some of the things we look at is we do a general inspection of the patient, so we'll go in and we'll look at them. Um, we look at their vitals. We look at their skin, so we're evaluating their skin integrity. Um, we look at their fingernails because a lot of times malnutrition does show up in your fingernails. Um, we look at their hair and their head and the skin on their head. Um, mouth, because a lot of times you'll see nutritional deficiencies around the mouth. Eyes and nose, um, the neck and chest, abdomen, and the mucoskeletal area. So this is what cachexia looks like. So very skinny. What is cachexia? So cachexia is something that would describe someone who's malnourished. And cachexia is basically someone who has lost visceral uh, body fat and muscle loss. Um, so, yeah. So here's a picture of same guy. This is him healthy, and this is him cachexic. So you can kind of see the difference. Some of the things you look at are like, his, uh, oh, what is this called? The collarbone, the shoulder, you can see his ribs, you can see this skin here. Those are some of the things I'm looking at when I'm looking for malnutrition. So is this person just posting like, oh, look at all the weight I lost photo? Or, or <coughs> you know, I'm not really sure what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> How do you turn cachexia? I'm sorry? How do you turn, like, how do you, like, do some people just have, like, an illness? Or do they, like, purposely? So, it's, cachexia really occurs a, for a, a, a variety of reasons. You know, for example, right now I have somebody in the hospital I'm seeing who has some sort of, we assume now, we thought it was cancer, but it was maybe some sort of eating disorder, and they've lost 200 pounds, and they're 82 pounds, and... Um, it just really depends. Sometimes it's cancer, sometimes it's just not eating, sometimes it's, sometimes people are really desperate and they just don't, they're just not eating enough. So that's usually what we're looking at. And usually it's, sometimes people, it's more the end of their life, but sometimes it's just chronic diseases that are making them malnourished. So these are some other things that we look at. So what we're looking at is, I'm not sure if you guys are seeing that well. The big thing, and this is a big thing for most men, is the size, is the side of your head here. Yeah. So there's, if you can look at somebody and have, you can see there's an indentation here. Like th these people are healthy. This is a mild, a moderate, and this is severely depleted. So you can really see it just sort of really concaves in there. Like so, here on the, like on you the, can on see the, their bones. Right like up here, you mean? Right here. Right in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. In your temple. So, we're looking at. So one of the things we're doing is we're touching them, and we 
usually with gloves, and we're just kind of touching in here in the orbital cavity here. You can, when people are malnourished, they have a lot of skin loss here. The buccal fat or buccal fat, people that are malnourished lose a lot of that. So this is this is a big indicator for most men. We see this a lot. So like right here, mm -hmm. there, and like if they're losing fat here and here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another thing is we're looking at legs. So this is a healthy leg, mild. This is a moderate, and this is severely depleted. So you can tell they've lost muscle and fat, and they're just very skinny here. They don't have any hanging here. And we see this, with, this is a big thing for, well, men and women, but a lot of men lose a lot of their muscle and fat here when they're severely malnourished too. So those are some of the things we're looking at. So this is um, the collarbone. So this is a healthy collarbone, mild, and then moderate, and then severe. So what we do with that is we're looking right underneath our collarbone here. And if you put your finger along it, if, you're, if your fingers are going underneath their collarbone, so that's, that's a sign of severe malnutrition. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Yeah, because that's, that's ribs there. Yeah, oh, you can God. see their ribs here. Yeah, I usually don't see ribs below the collarbone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So another, some of the things we're looking at are vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So, um, a niacin deficiency is called pellagra, and you can see a rash. Usually it's on the back of their neck, and that's what that looks like, so we're evaluating for that. Um, riboflavin deficiency usually ends up um, chelosis and stomitis, and so that ends up in their tongue, so I'll ask them to stick their tongue out. Um, iron deficiency is a big one. So this is called spooning of your nails. And when somebody has iron deficiency anemia, their nails actually look like a spoon. It goes up like that. So it's not even the color, it's the shape. Yeah, it's the shape of the nail that's going. It looks like a spoon. Yeah. And then a beriberi, which is a thymine deficiency, looks like this. A lot of the B vitamins deficiency, there's a lot of skin issues going on. So it looks like bug bites. And this is a zinc deficiency, which we, isn't, it's not super uncommon, actually. We see some zinc deficiencies. What do, what, where do you get zinc from if you're not taking the multi vitamins? So zinc usually comes from meat and some oysters and things like that. Gotcha. Excuse me, but usually when people are deficient in zinc, it's because they have an underlying um, illness. And one of the things might be that they have a huge wound that is draining. Oh, and wow. anybody that has a draining wound, a lot of times they're deficient in zinc. Or if somebody has um, something called like a high output fistula, um, which is basically part of their stomach uh, has, I'm going to tell you guys too much, <laughs> it makes its way out to the front, it makes a little hole out here, and it just starts draining. So they have, they, you lose zinc that way. Is that, the, are people born with that? Or is that um, so sometimes when people have a lot of GI issues, gastrointestinal issues, or they've had surgeries, you're really at risk to have fistulas create like that. Yeah. So it's like your stomach actually trying to form its way to the outside it's, of your body. It's your intestines. That's crazy. Yeah, it wow. is crazy. When you see pictures of it, you're like, how did this happen? <laughs> but it's it's not as uncommon as you think. So like the intestinal wall mm -hmm. basically fuses with the like abdominal wall and yes. it creates an opening to it the It creates outside. an opening and you just start having drainage out of it. But you know, your intestines can do that to other parts of your body too. It can you can it can create fistulas to other parts of your body. It's like working against you. Um, protein deficiency and hair loss is a big thing we see with a lot of gals. Um, a lot of older women, a lot of men too, but a lot of older women don't really eat meat. They just don't eat it. They don't like it. They don't eat it. It's tough to chew. So they're really not getting any protein in their, in their diet at all. Like they're eating, they're drinking coffee and they're eating crackers or whatever. And this is kind of what that looks like when they have protein deficiency. So what do we do when somebody's malnourished? If they're able to eat, we start what's called oral nutrition supplementation. And usually we use like supplements like Ensure or Boost. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of those kind of things, but those are oral like milkshakes. They don't really have milk in them, but 
There are supplements to increase calories and protein and vitamins and minerals. So we use those to sort of help increase calories and protein for those people. Um, or we just try to get them to eat more food. Like if we can give them snacks or foods that they like. So we really just try to get them to eat and educate them on the importance, importance of eating. So if somebody is unable to eat, um, we usually recommend or initiate nutrition support with a feeding tube that um, usually goes through their nose or we feed them through their veins called total parenteral nutrition. Does anybody, has anybody ever seen anything like that? I've seen the tube through the nose, but mm -hmm. through the veins you can do that. Right, yes, and we use a different formula for that, but we do through the veins. Yeah. So like, what, if what's being pumped through the nose there, of course, going down, how far does that tube go down? Well, it depends. So sometimes they'll put a no, uh, a, a feeding tube called a Dopop tube through your nose, and it goes down into your stomach. Like all the way down? Yeah, right into your stomach. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you want to get it down there, because if you don't get it far enough, you can really aspirate and have lots of problems. So we want to get it far down there, and sometimes we can get into the small intestine, which is better. And that way you don't have the issue of it coming back up and regurgitating. Interesting. Yeah. Who, who does that? Is it a GI doc that puts no, it No, actually nurses put them in. Oh, wow. Yeah, they just come in with a dop off tube and they'll put it in, they'll say, swallow, swallow, and <laughs> you swallow, they put it in. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And then you get an x-ray and it's in there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. What do you do with someone that doesn't like to eat? Because I've like, seen people who like don't eat anything. Like, they just eat like, like french fries or they just eat like, chicken nuggets or something. It's super difficult. It's difficult to get people to eat when they don't want to eat. It is. So it's really a lot of education, and hopefully they'll get on board with it. Um, you know, they can hopefully see the benefit of, <coughs> you know, you need to eat if you want to get better, you know. And that's, it's difficult. Um, sometimes people just don't feel good. Like when somebody's not feeling good, they just don't want to eat. So it's difficult to try to get them to eat. So we try to talk about foods that they will eat, that can actually you know, have a goal for like how much they're taking in every day. It's, it's hard. Yeah, it is. So this is kind of what a feeding tube looks like. So this is a, a mannequin, but the, it goes in their nose. And this is somebody that maybe is supposed to be laying down, but usually if somebody's alert and oriented, you're sitting up doing it. But if somebody is in an ICU bed or they're comatose. This is how they do it. They just stick it in their nose, just like that. How do you know where you're going? Mm -hmm. Well, usually it's it's natural that it goes down that way. It doesn't ever try to go in the larynx or anything? It does. That's why you get an x-ray. Oh. after you it. Yes, it does. So sometimes it goes into the lungs. <coughs> so we never start any tube feeding, internal nutrition, until we get an x-ray yeah. and to make sure it's in, right, in the right place. Because sometimes it's not. Why don't you just put it in the mouth? Well, whenever we have somebody that's on a ventilator, we actually do that. Um, but when somebody is alert and oriented, we do put it through the nose because you can kind of tape it off. And then they can talk and whatever. And it's kind of weird to have it, like, to be awake and have it in your, in your mouth. But when they're on a ventilator, we do put it through their mouth. It's called an oral gastric tube. Yeah. So that's how we do that. So when, we, when we're feeding somebody, it goes through their nose. Um, a nasogastric feeding tube goes into the stomach, so usually this part, this is the stomach, and then sometimes we put, do a nasal jejunal feeding tube, and it goes down into the jejunal. So the reason that we want to do that is that we want to bypass the stomach. So sometimes the patient, their stomach isn't empty, um, which happens pretty often when somebody is very sick, very critically ill, their stomach doesn't really work. So we want to put it down into the jejunum, and that's usually working all the time. So that's no problem. I'm still trying to, okay, sorry, the question, but yeah. like trying to visualize, like, if they're putting this thing in, how do you get it to go to, like, the pyloric sphincter and through, like, just, because, like, it doesn't seem like it would find its way. Well, the end of it is weighted. Okay. So it's weighted, and it comes down here. So if we're doing a nasal jejunal feeding tube, there's a couple different ways. Usually the tip is weighted. And if they can get it down here, peristalsis will take it down. So oh, it might wow. take a, it might take six or eight hours to get down there. Okay, or, so the body just kind of helps take it. It can. Down. Okay. Or sometimes we do it through IR, which is interventional radiology. So what happens then is there's a special area in the hospital where they go and they take them into this radiology suite, and they can see their body 
while they're stuffing it in there. <laughs> we see where it goes. Yeah. And they're, those people are really like professionals at doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> so sometimes IR has to come in to save the day. So those are the two kinds of ways that we feed. So generally we feed people in, in the stomach, but sometimes when somebody's critically ill, it's better if it's beyond the stomach into the small intestine. People tolerate those two feedings better and we can feed them while they're critically ill and feed them intrally through their intestines because that's always better for you to be fed that way. So, and this is kind of what it looks like just in the hospital. It's kind of taped off here and um, she's got a bag of tube feeding. Yeah, what, is, what is it made out of? What's yeah, it? what's in the bag? Yeah, magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's basically... It looks like my puke. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and it smells like that too. No. Oh, gosh. <laughs> no, it doesn't. You really can't smell it. But, um, okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, there's different kinds of tube feeding. Some of them are really basic tube feedings when people don't need anything special. But some tube feedings are, are higher in protein, lower in fat, higher in carbohydrate, less Less fat. It just there's many different kinds. So they make them on the spot. No, they actually are made. Um, th there's companies that make them. So a company called Abbott, which you may yeah. be familiar with, because they usually do a lot of um, baby formula. But they also make tube feedings. So we have. They make probably 15 or 20 different <coughs> kinds of tube feedings. So, so they make, for example, just the names of it. It would be like Jevity, Osmolite, Glucerna, Peptamin, blah, blah, blah. Like there's a, a we, on our formulary, we carry, mm, I'm going to say six or eight different kinds of tube feedings. So some, one tube feeding is for a diabetic. One tube feeding is for um, somebody that doesn't really have any extra needs. They're just sort of, they just can't swallow, so they need tube feeding, but they don't have any other critical issues. Sometimes a patient has huge wounds and needs a lot of protein, so we have a high protein tube feeding. Sometimes patients need different things, so we have all different tube feedings. Some tube feedings are broken down into elemental form, so there's no like complex carbohydrates in them, there's no complex proteins in them, everything is amino acids, and either glucose or fructose, so the body absorbs it really well. So that's one of the things that I do is I assess what this patients need, what the specific kind of tube feeding they need. So that's one of the things that I do. So I guess probably too, like you would have to make a different choice if it was going to the stomach versus the jejunum. You need know, <coughs> your proteins to be broken down pretty pretty well, probably before they get to the jejunum. You know, actually that used to be the way that we do it, but now it's been shown just through different science and studies that um, most patients tolerate a full formed tube feeding into the jejunum. Okay. Now it just really depends too. <coughs> How well they're tolerating it and things like that. But I guess because there's not like there's proteins, but there's not like connective tissue. Like with like red meat, you have to have all the connective tissue broken down in the stomach. Right. Whereas that it broke. It's already proteins. basically broken down, but it has Order access inside. to all the pancreatic enzymes. Yeah. Right there. So. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what that looks like when we have somebody with a two B. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so sometimes people need. Um, a long-term tube feeding. <coughs> like let's a lot of times it's going to be older people maybe that have had a stroke and they can't swallow anymore. Somebody that has cancer and they can't swallow and they do what's called a PEG tube which is a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. So basically what they do is surgically they'll put something into the stomach from the outside and it just goes straight into your stomach and then you are fed through here. So then you're hooked up to the pump through here. So Does that not get infected? It can. Not, it can. It can, but it's usually, it usually doesn't. Um, but, it, I mean, it can. I mean, there's, everything has, co yeah, consequences to everything. But generally, after they put it in, you just kind of keep it um, dry and clean, and you can take a shower with it and whatever, so no, you just have to cover it. You just sort of clean around it every day. But people have them for years. Mm -hmm. And usually you have to have them changed every, maybe once a year or twice a year, just exchanged, but yeah. So that's how we feed sometimes people, when people can't eat, this is how we feed them. Exchange or change <coughs> the outside part, the inside part? The outside the, part, oh. and that's usually the doctor does that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes we feed people through the veins. So that is something that we do make. So that is made in the pharmacy. 
because that's totally broken down. That is specific amino acids, specific um, carbohydrate, that's specific lipids. And that is something that I do the ingredients for and make. I make all the ingredients and the pharmacy makes it. So I'm estimating energy needs, protein needs, multivitamin needs, that kind of stuff, putting it all together, and then the pharmacy makes it. And we run it through what's called a central venous catheter, which is usually placed here. So you might see somebody, I don't know if anybody in your family's ever had maybe cancer and they've had a port here. Yeah. Um, or sometimes this is placed during surgery if we know that they're going to need TPN. So we'll, that'll be there and that's how we feed them. And that has to go into a special vein called the central venous catheter, the central venous artery. So that has to go in there and um, I'm forgetting my words right now. Because it has to be a pretty big air, a pretty big large board um, or, or vein to go into. So we, we can feed people that way. What's with the three to why is it not there? So what they'll do is they'll put a port in and they will hang three different, well they'll put, that, they'll put this in and they'll put three different ports. Because many times people need more than one thing going through here. Oh, okay. So we will have TPN, they will have um, antibiotics that they'll also have to have, and then they'll have to have, um, it, it, just sometimes they'll have, to, they'll have to have two antibiotics, or they'll have to have different pressors or just different things that they might need. So it's always good to have three ports because they'll use them. Okay. Yeah. And then sometimes we have what's called a pick line, which is called a peripherally inserted central catheter. So that actually goes in through here, and it goes all the way in here into your superior vena cava. And the superior vena cava is where it has to end up going for that to work through. So uh, actually we have nurses in the hospital that place these. There's a specialty um, segment of nurses that know how to do it. The pick nurse, and they come in and they put the pick line in. <laughs> and we can do TPN do that way. So that's kind of what it looks like. Um, so the TPN is here, the pump is here, and this is a, a central line that goes right here into, into the, uh, well, yeah, that goes into the central venous catheter. So that's how we feed them. So it's a pump, it's not gravity fed then? Right, so that's a pump, and usually what we do is we'll feed somebody like an 80 mils an hour, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. Um, usually like two liters a day, but it constantly infuses. So one of the things that my role for that is I assess calorie and protein needs. So what I do is I usually look at height, weight, I look at their labs, and I assess what their calorie needs are with their um, stress factors. Um, I assess the appropriate mode of feeding. So do we want to feed somebody intrally, which is like, can they eat? Can they just eat? Or do they need a dog pop tube through their nose? Um, or do they already have a peg tube? And that's how we're going to feed them. Um, or do we need to feed feed through their vein. So then I choose the appropriate formula for enteral feeds depending on what their calorie and protein needs are, their disease states, and their comorbidities. Um, I calculate the volume needed to meet nutritional needs. And then if I'm using parental nutrition, I calculate carbohydrates, protein, and fats needed to meet their nutritional needs every day. So that's, that's what I do at the hospital. I'm a nutrition support clinician. How many patients do you typically oversee in, in a typical day? I probably see 20 plus patients a day, but I, how we do it at the hospital is that there's different zones. So I cover probably up to, on my zones, there's probably 60 or 70 patients that I'm kind of responsible for, but probably a day I'm only seeing about 20 of them. Because a lot of them are eating okay, knowing mm -hmm. they're rolling, they don't necessarily need a whole right. lot on that. Right, yeah. So does like the hospital give them meals or they have to like, it's like, um, go out and, like, eat the meals if they're, like, able to eat. Oh, no, we, we provide meals at the hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have to decide everything that goes on every tray? No, no, okay. no, no, okay. no. When, they, when patients are eating, and they're eating fine, I, I, a lot of times I don't even see them. Okay. Yeah, they're picking up their menu and eating like they're, at, they're on vacation. It's oh, fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So what I do in a usual day is I review all the patients on the floors that I'm assigned to, 
and I make a list of whom, who I'm going to see based on there's different screens. So when a patient comes in the hospital and they're new, they're screened by nurses uh, for nutrition and they're screening for weight loss or poor in intake. Um, I also see patients that have wounds, um, patients that are at risk for wounds, anybody that's on tube feeding at home. Um, so those are, and, I'm, and I start my day by figuring out who I'm going to see for the day. So I make out my to-do list. Also, there's follow-up. So a patient I may have seen like yesterday, I may follow up with them today just to see how they're doing. Um, do I need to make any changes with their interval feeds? That kind of stuff. Um, I attend multidisciplinary meetings, and usually those are meetings that the doctors, the pharmacists, respiratory therapists, speech therapists, um, gosh, nurses are there. And we usually, like in the ICU, we meet every morning and we discuss every patient and then what the plan for the day is going to be. So it's a really good way to discuss what's going on and what's happening and everybody's on the same page. So one of the things that might happen is like, for example, today we got a new patient in, they're on the ventilator, um, they have a heart attack, they're just kind of doing all the things that they need to do to evaluate them. So we want to start internal nutrition with them because we want to feed them very early. So they have a, a feeding tube in, so we started tube feeding on that patient. So part of my job is to evaluate how many calories do they need, how many grams of protein do they need, and then I write the order for what they're going to get that day. Um, so we have the meetings. Any new patients that are nutritional risk, I do new assessments on. And if I need to do one of those nutrition-focused exams, then I'll do that on that patient. And one of the things that we're doing is we're looking for malnutrition so it can be coded so they can be a, have a diagnosis of malnutrition. Um, I educate patients on appropriate diet restrictions for their health, like weight loss, cardiac and diabetic restrictions. My floors, I don't do a lot of that, but there's some floors in the hospital where they do a lot of those. So the cardiac floors, when patients come in with congestive heart failure or they've had a heart attack, there's a dietitian that meets with those patients and the families and talk about healthy eating, and diet restrictions, and diabetes, if they have diabetes, and things like that. Um, and I monitor patients to ensure they're meeting their goals while they're in the hospital. So those are, that's kind of what I do during the day. Oh, that's it? Okay. Um, there's also um, the dietitians in the hospital that are diabetes educators, which is another route. So, um, they are specialized in seeing patients with diabetes, and they discuss diet, but they also discuss their medications with them, so they'll do insulin teaching, or if they're on any sort of like um, oral medication for diabetes, they teach them that, and they talk about how to monitor blood sugars, and you know, they have AccuCheck, but now a lot of people are using like those Libre monitors, or Dexcom, which basically they put on their skin and there's an app on your phone that constantly evaluates what your blood sugar is. So they teach them about those things. So that's another area that dietitians are in. So we're kind of everywhere.